This episode of the Kind of Funny Games Cast is brought to you by Sherry's Berries. There's no one like your Valentine. This year, treat them to an unforgettable gift that's as unique as they are. Don't tell her, but I am definitely getting Gia some of these babies. This was written for Tim. I'm not cheating on Jen. Sherry's Berries will deliver your gift fresh and on time, guaranteed, or your money back. These berries are decadent, fresh, juicy, sweet, and shareable, just like Gia Harris. Damn it, Tim. And... You can choose to get them dipped in white, milk, or dark, dark chocolatey goodness like Gia Harris. What does that mean? To With Valentine's Day right around the corner, there's only one way to get these freshly dipped strawberries from Sherry's Berries starting at $19.99. Go to berries.com. That's berries, B-E-R-R-I-E-S.com. Click on the microphone in the top right and enter in. KF Games. That's berries.com. Use the code KF Games. Help support this show and get some sweet, sweet berries for your sweet, sweet Valentine, like my sweet, sweet baby Gia Harris. God damn it, Tim. All right, so here we go. Uh, first off, I'm pretty sure I didn't say it. Patreon producer, Steven Insler, thank you for your 3,000th month of support uh, over at patreon.com slash kind of funny games. I'm going to read questions now, though, that you all, because Tim tweeted out, hey, going to have Pete Hines on. What are your Bethesda questions? You all, of course, went to kind of funny.com slash game cast questions. Game, game? No. T is Tim, Tim left already, right? He's, of course, he gets to rest what, what, before this. What thing. half of them did was just replied back to Tim and I and said, here's my question. And then, so hey, one, of you, do that. one of your beautiful fans was like, um, he posted a link where you're supposed yeah, to yeah, put no, all these. All time. Hey, go to this link. And yeah. then be, you can I go was, to kind of funny. I was good. I didn't answer any of them on uh, Twitter so that I didn't ruin, if, ruin the fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. And I like this because I tried to dodge some of these because I knew last we doubled up a lot last time. Not this time. No, Sorry, we are says just curious what the thinking was behind revealing Fallout 4 only a few months before the game launched. It seemed to have been a very popular move at a time when we see quite a few AAA games being delayed frequently after being revealed years earlier. Do you think it's a precedent? Other will, will follow. Um, I don't know if it's a precedent. Um, as I said, as it relates to, to us, uh, we try and evaluate every game based on what its needs are and how long we think um, it'll take. Um, I will tell you in general, though, and I'm 98% I'm confident in this answer, that just about every dev in the world would love for the window to be like a day or yeah. almost not at all yeah. because... Um, they hate showing off their stuff in progress. It stresses them out. It's a lot of work to put this stuff together. And the longer the period is, the more stuff that they're going to have to do because you can't just announce a game X months in advance and then do nothing. You got to you got to put some screenshots out there. Sure. You got to show some gameplay. You got to do a trailer. You got right. You got to talk about the characters. You got to do whatever. So all of that stuff is more things that get added to their pile on top of this really hard thing of making a, and shipping a video game. So um, in general, devs always like it shorter. I've done campaigns that were literally years and years long um, and, and all the way down to what we did for Shelter, which was the best one, which yep. is, hey, here's the thing, and you can go download it right now, uh, on uh, at least on iPhone, which was awesome. Um, and, and really good. I, I don't know what we'll do going forward. Um, there's always this bouncing act of a lot of internal things, right? The, the sales guys working with retailers, setting all of this stuff up, working with publishing partners in countries where, where we don't distribute games. You need time to set all that stuff up and to get the word of mouth um, out there. But I would say, in general, we felt like uh, you know what we did with Fallout 4 was a success. Um, but but every game is is different and has its own needs and as far as what other publishers might do, I have no idea. I feel like it comes down to two, like how much do you have to explain, right? Like Fallout 4, cool, it's Fallout 4, awesome, great. Mm -hmm. Whereas like Prey, all right, cool, we're doing something completely different. You need the trailers. You need us to walk you through and explain what the systems are and how this is going to shake yeah, out. That's very true. Yeah. Um, Mr. Jetton says, uh, how's that new Wolfenstein coming? Uh, I Colossus. Don't, uh, uh, the, what is it? Colossus. Remember this one? You showed it in, the, you showed it in your little trailer. I yeah. did? Yeah. It, it booted up and it went through all the games and that was there. Really? Yeah. It said New Colossus? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Weird. Uh -huh. um, uh, Machine Games uh, has been hard at work on something, uh, which which I can tell you I have played. It is 
fucking bananas, uh, and I can't wait to to show what it actually is and what they're actually up to. E three twenty seven, and I'll let you know when. Okay, okay. Just, no, well, E three twenty seventeen. Uh, kind of Pete says hello, Pete. I I assume Kind of Pete made this account to ask you this question. Okay, hello, Pete. Can you talk a little bit about the major differences between big titles such as Fallout and similar ones like Dishonored or Prey from a marketing perspective? Big and small only in terms of sales figures, not quality, of course. Um, the short answer to that is there really isn't any. Like the the our approach to every game is we have to do the best job possible to put the best foot forward for that product. Uh Regard and that that's true regardless of it's of how many sales figures. So you know, Skyrim shipped with twenty million or whatever the hell it was over the first sure. few months. It, it's not like we tried extra hard for Skyrim, but this other game over here ah, is it's only two million. It's like ah shit, we can just mail that one in. Like we'll just <laughs> you work on that during you know lunch breaks and and uh, you know happy hours and stuff. Um, that 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 the way we're organized, the way my team is organized, that you know. Um, I, I stand here and talk to Greg much like Todd does about the game and it's sort of like it, it ain't me doing it. I, I did not do the Fallout 4 campaign. I, I will go on record as saying I didn't do almost the vast majority of Fallout 4. I, um, you know, that was Paris and Carlos and Ange and Matt Grandstaff and Tracy and Aaron and Steve Perkins and all these people that I have on my team who spend all this time working on these things and making up cool fun ideas the special videos that we did yeah, yeah. like that was all like paris's thing she she sort of pushed that and put together this great thing and it was so cool they ended up being ended up being in the game um but the people who are working on these things like they put everything they have into making the thing that they're working on the best possible, as as possible. because they're 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 not working on fallout they're not working on doom or whatever else their whole li- their whole focus is on you know the title that they're that they're assigned to. So we don't really half measure it or say like, well, we'll try 70% because this game's sales are, are X. Everything that we do is like, we got to make it feel like a Bethesda game, which means quality and fun and doing some things that are interesting and unique and, and really bringing the essence of what the devs are making to the to the fans b- beforehand so they really get a sense of what the game is about. That's something interesting too that you talked about a bit yesterday that we didn't touch on here the fact that your devs you make you don't make them like you have a gun to there. You allow or <laughs> you want your devs to be as involved as possible. Right? In the in our process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um and I, I think I used the machine games guys as an example because they had been uh, somewhere else before working with other publishers and when we worked on the first Wolfenstein we were talking to them about like the box or the trailers or all of this stuff and they're like like what? What? Like you want us to talk to you about what the box is? We're like, yeah. Like we have these ideas and designs, and like, is there? Something? They're like, yeah. Well, like half the time for other games we worked on, like we found out about the box when it got announced online. We're like, oh, they picked a box for us. Like, okay, well that's that that's not ugly. what. Yeah, that's not what Born I would have done. Conspiracy or whatever. Um, but that's part of our process. Is we want. Um, we want the devs to be involved in the process and to buy into what we're doing and to make sure that everything we're doing fits with the tone and the vibe of the game we're making. Cause that's really your, the beginning of your interaction with any game is not when you put the disc in, it's all the stuff that you do and see around that game leading up to then the way a prey trailer makes you feel is part of the experience of playing mm-hmm. prey because it's, it's creating a tone and a vibe and for what your expectations are, which is why I was talking before about we we really don't ever do things that are widely wildly disconnected from the game experience because we think the marketing is part of the game experience, that the website and the label on the disc and what the box looks like all ought to feed into the same kind of experience that the game itself is is providing. You put TLC into it. You yes. Use that from here. A on. lot. There you go. Yeah. Um, Space Ghost says, hey, Pete, as a young professional in entertainment PR myself, film, what advice would you give to people trying to make the transition into gaming PR slash marketing? Mm-hmm. What are the most essential characteristics, tools, or skills? P.S. Prey looks amazing. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I get this question a lot. Um, uh, the truth is there's no sort of formulaic, easy answer. Everybody's got a lot of different paths and... Uh, uh, I've only ever worked at Bethesda, so I don't really have the ability to say like, well, this is this is the kind of stuff that EA looks at at Activision. Like, mm-hmm. how, how the hell would I know? I've only been at Bethesda. But in general, <laughs> I, I think that that 
Um, what we tend to look for are people who are well-rounded. They're, they've been involved in a lot of different things. Uh, you know, if you do PR, you didn't just do PR. You worked in, in a lot of different areas, whether you volunteered for stuff or, um, you know, took on uh, uh, student assistant positions while yeah, you were you in ran, college. You were talking about how much you did in college, right? Yeah, like when I was at Wake, I was, a, I was a DJ at the radio station, and I uh, was the manager of the, of the Macintosh labs back when none of us had our own computers, and we all went to, a, to labs to use them. You, you hip youngsters that have no idea what that <laughs> the is. The iPads, um, your phones. Yeah, I was a research assistant for a finance professor. I was a student assistant for the sports information department. I was a announcer for men's soccer games. I did women, uh, women's basketball color commentary. Like I did all this different stuff that kind of gave me insight into different areas like public speaking and writing mm, mm, and, mm. And, and and working with people, whatever it is. And I, I think the more you can do to make yourself more well-rounded, it's invaluable because, you know, if in a company like mine, those lines are blurred. Just because you're working in PR doesn't mean you need you don't need to know about community or influencers or branding and, you know, how to come up with a, uh, a cohesive branding campaign sure. that includes trailers or videos, right? We involve everybody in all of that stuff. Um, the other thing I would say is to whatever extent possible, look for opportunities to put yourself in front of developers and publishers. That might be... Um, Signing up to be a beta tester for something and giving really good beta test notes, which, by the way, 95% of people have no clue what that means. Giving beta test notes does not mean, here's all of my ideas how to make your game really cool and fun. It's a beta. They're already fucking done with all of that stuff. What they're looking for is what's broken here's or not fun. The world. <laughs> right, like, and writing and reproducing it. Like, here's how I can reproduce how to fall through. Not like, you should do this and you should have this feature. Like, devs take that stuff and crinkle it up and throw it in the trash can. They're not looking to add features in beta. They're, they're looking for well-written, well-thought-out commentary on what's not working in their game. Uh, that can be addressed. So opportunities like that are awesome. It's a great way to get yourself in front of devs. Doesn't matter if it's an indie or a big company or whatever it is. Look for those opportunities to put yourself out there in front of folks and give them a chance to recognize you for what you can do because you'd be amazed how many times um, people notice you or that that matters. And the other thing is to keep in mind that in this day and age, video games the people in your audience, like I bet most of them have grown up by and large with video games just being a thing. Whereas guys like me, like, well, that wasn't really a thing until I was 11 or 12 yeah. or whatever. And it's now become a, a focus of that's what I want to do for a living, which means it's highly competitive, which means you got to do stuff to set yourself apart. You got to stand you, out. If you're just going to school and working on a degree to be a, whether it's an animator or a marketing person or whatever, if that's all you're bringing to the table, that's that's simply not good enough. You got to take it the extra step and let your passion and enthusiasm and your desire uh, come through. I want to do, do two more. Okay, you ready? Yep. Yep. Sam N.W., what will Bethesda's strategy look like going forward in terms of studio expansion slash acquisition? Are you planning to expand further? Or are you satisfied with the number of games that you're currently publishing? Uh, we have no, we've never had any concrete plans for expanding. We continue to look for opportunities of studios we want to work with, but I, I think we covered this a little bit before, but in, in general, like we're just looking for folks that we really want to work with or that have ideas to do games and, and the experience of proving they can do them. That, that is a good fit for us. Whether or not we acquire them is in by and large, almost Irrelevant. Like you just want to put out good stuff. Yeah, I just want to put out good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we look for those opportunities to do those kinds of things and to, and to make good stuff. But there's no like acquire three companies in three years or, or whatever. Like, it's not really because then what you end up doing is just acquiring people to hit a goddamn number. And then right, you, right, right. You, you, you want to look at how big our stable yeah, is. Yeah. And then you regret it. So you want to make sure that everything you do is to a level of quality and you're working with people who can, who can do that. This is a part of the industry, a side of it that I'm ignorant about. So does it, is it as simple as, a friend of a friend introduces you to somebody at GDC or at Dice, somebody you've Bless met you. before in the pa background comes around and is just like, hey, like, well, and you're just shooting the shit about what's going on. Like, well, we have this idea for a game and we're we're shopping it, or is it very, is it very? If I'm a independent uh, developer, is it very? Uh, I book a meeting through someone and I show up and I have a PowerPoint and. It, it could be any or all of the above and a lot of flavors in between. In between. There, there are any number of people that that. Some number of us. But the 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 main person for this in in our group is definitely not me. It's it's uh, the guy who actually recruited me to Bethesda. His name is Todd Vaughn. Uh, he's our VP of uh, development, and he, he's 
He's great at a lot of things, including identifying talent, identifying people who have a good fit in terms of their sensibilities and approach and identifying projects and games that are really going to going to stand out. And so a lot of it is just him keeping up with people and having conversations. And sometimes it's formal. Somebody's going to come in and present a thing. And sometimes it's it's what you said, like you bump into somebody at GDC who you haven't seen in a while, but like, hey, by the way, like we're finishing up a thing. I want to talk to you about an idea that we have. Like nice. it, you never know where it's going to come from. Arcane was entirely because Todd kept up with Roth Colantonio over a number of years. He really liked and, and we really liked and respected some of the stuff they had done. Um, like uh, the the Might and Magic, the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not Heroes. It's the other one. The, f- oh. the first person. The God damn it. Okay. You know what I'm talking I, about. Yeah. But they did a really cool. Uh, Messiah. Is that what it was? was Messiah of Ma- Dark. Know. Just go. Just go. Oh, go. The comments are flying right through. Uh, Someone in their car is listening to the NPC. And, 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 and screaming, screaming out this game they love. Yeah, pulling over the side of the road and yelling at me. Um, <laughs> it's been a, it's right been a right long away. goddamn day. Um, but they had done a number of things that we really thought were innovative and unique and different. And and he kept up with Rop and kept looking for an opportunity when they were, you know, coming off a project and had some Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. Uh, screw is. you. Stop tweeting at me. Um, and uh, and uh, he, you know, he eventually found a spot where they were had time to talk to us about a, a thing and what we could work on. And that ended up being dishonored. And then in the process of working on Dishonored, we started the conversation and they ended up coming in house, but that was just simply him keeping up with the studio that he really liked. And, and we talked about and people played their games and, and, and looking for an opportunity and it, and it worked out great. Awesome. And then final question comes from JRV. He says, or she says, how important do you think new IP are in the current video game market compared to both integrating popular games and reviving old dormant IP? Uh, it depends. We good? <laughs> no. No, you want me to go? on that answer. Okay. Mr. Uh, Hines, it, it the de- blue book. It depends, and we do a little bit of everything from sort of rebooting things like a Wolfenstein that maybe had some of the sheen off. I mean, it was this really important first of the first-person shooters, but had seen better days that Machine Game said, mm-hmm. we really want to do that and kind of bring all these things that uh, we do in our games of blending action and shooting and story and character. Um, uh, let's see in the case of the evil within it was uh, Shinji wanting to do kind of return to the roots of survival horror and like well like we don't have anything that's a fit for that we should do a new IP Dishonored was the same thing like Roth and Harvey wanting to do this really grounded first person immersive power uh, assassin fantasy stuff like yeah I don't have anything that fits that what are we going to call it? what do we do actually in that case that was a, that was a game design that Todd Vaughn had written up that I swear was on our network like starting in 99 or 2000 when I got to Bethesda and sat there for a decade and when he talked to Arcane ended up being a, a different it ended up being different than the way he had written it up but the same idea of like yeah, this yeah. assassin and he's like, I've been looking for you for so long I've been waiting for you for so long um, so it really just depends it depends on who the studio is what they want to make sometimes they specifically say hi I want to make that like in the case of Quake Champions it was uh, not just hey we want to do something like in the free-to-play first person space it was no we want to take Quake and bring Quake to but make it a first person free to play, but stupid fast, you know, fast paced uh, esports kind of title. So yeah. it, it really just depends on what's the idea and what's the fit for it. And, and to be quite honest, we've done a healthy amount of both over the last five years. I mean, we did Rage with ID, we we rebooted Wolf with Machine Games, we did new IP with Arcane, we did new IP with. Uh, with Tango, we we did the Elder Scrolls with uh, Zenimax Online, who took the Elder Scrolls and brought it into this completely different um, genre than we were used to in, in online games. It, it really just depends on on what's the right fit. Gotcha. Is that, is that a better answer? That was, better it than, that was in our okay. defense. Thank you. You did excellent. Thank you. Again. This was really fun. No. The, even the second time. Like, it's still... It's one of... I mean, I honestly, I think this might be longer than the first episode. That's uh, surprising. It actually is. Yeah. But I mean, it's you're one of those guys that I could talk to forever because you're fascinating. You don't bullshit around. You have answers and you know so much. Well, you thank, ha- thank you for having me on. Oh, my like, God. Well, was, thank you for a, coming this, back. This was, a lot of, this was a lot of fun. Like, well, I texted well, you last night. I'm like... This is the worst text I've had a sense <laughs> since Kind of Funny started. Like, it's I, fine. It I know. Yeah, I know. We, we've always... It, we always knew one day the sky would fall on that. It's just... Of course, it's got to fall when we have an awesome episode with a guest. Other than when we're just sitting around. Well, I hope this one was at least this one was okay. Good. Kevin, was this one? It was better. Oh wow! Because no Tim, right? 
Well, I was going to say Colin, but sure. Yeah, oh, no. No. You say that, though, he's going to come stab you. Whatever. <laughs> come at me, Colin. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching the second ever episode 106 of the kind of funny games cast remember you can get it early on patreon do all that jazz follow him on twitter he'll tweet back at you unless you've been muted and if he doesn't tweet back you probably got muted and then no until next time it's been our pleasure to serve you